Hello and welcome to the latest in the Science Museum Group's Global Climate Talk series. I'm Roger Highfield, Science Director for the Group, and I'm delighted to introduce tonight's virtual event. This is the final Climate Talk of 2021, a year that's seen so much debate on the critical issue of how to curb damaging climate change, most notably at the COP26 Climate Summit in Glasgow last month. In all, we've organized 15 talks, 16 including the one that you're about to see, to air topics that range from climate finance to the role of space research in understanding climate change, the health of our oceans, the role of consumers and how agriculture needs to be rethought to fix our climate. We've heard 68 speakers so far, joining us from the United States, Canada, Kiribati, Kenya, Uganda, the UK, Austria, India and Nicaragua. Those speakers have included John Kerry, Jane Goodall, Sapatha Dasgupta, Maggie Adderin Pocock, Tim Peake, and many more. I'd like to say a huge thanks to all our speakers for lending their voice and their expertise to these events at such a critical time for action on climate change, and to all of you who've watched and who continue to watch our climate talks. But the most critical climate talk of all, of course, happened last month when world leaders, climate envoys and negotiators descended on Glasgow to attempt to plot a course forward to bring us closer to limiting global temperature rise to one and a half degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. Now, some commentators feel COP26 was a qualified success, while others dismiss it as yet more blah, blah, blah. For our verdict, we've assembled a brilliant panel tonight to review the success of COP26. I'm delighted to now hand over to your chair for this evening, who returns to Climate Talks after chairing our August debate. He's an investigative journalist who's presented numerous documentaries and programs for TV and radio across various BBC outlets, such as Radio 4 and Radio 5 Live. Welcome, Kaza Alon. Thank you very much, Roger, and uh, yeah, welcome to all of you watching at home as well. It's the latest final edition of the year in the Science Museum Group's Climate Talk series. It's been a privilege to be a part of this. There have been so many fantastic speakers, and I'm looking forward to tonight's talk as well. As you've just heard from Roger, the series has welcomed a who's who of climate science policy and advocacy in the build-up to COP26 in Glasgow last month, which I was also very fortunate enough to attend. Now, tonight's discussion will attempt to unpack, unpick and review the outcomes of the Climate Summit in as much detail as possible within 90 minutes. And, well, there is a lot to unpack. What were the successes? What were the failures? What promises were made? And will they be kept? Well, let's introduce our brilliant panel, many of whom returned to Climate Talks after participating in previous editions. Now, before I do, I just want to point out that live captions are available tonight, provided by Stage Text. So to turn those on, just click the captions icon at the bottom of the screen. So let's meet the panel then, shall we? Firstly, welcome back to Wanjuhi Unjuroji, who joins us from Nairobi in Kenya. Wanjuhi is a climate activist, forest restoration advocate, entrepreneur, and founder of People Planet Africa, returns to Climate Talks after helping to kick off the series in the very first event back in January. Welcome back, Wanjuhi. Looking forward to talking to you. Thank you. Next, Thank you. good evening to Dr. Radhika Kosler, who's a research director of the Oxford India Centre for Sustainable Development, associate professor at the Smith School of Enterprise and Environment, University of Oxford, and member of the Science Museum's Energy Revolution Advisory Group. Now, I had the pleasure of chairing a fascinating climate talk with Radhika back in August, so it's great to see you again. On that very same panel, actually, in August, was uh, Myrna cunningham Kane, who joins us again tonight as well. Myrna is the chair of the Fund for Development of Indigenous Peoples of Latin America and the Caribbean. So nice to see you as well, Myrna. Looking forward to chatting to you again. Next, we can meet someone who joins the Climate Talk series for the first time, Professor Jim Skier, Professor of Sustainable Energy at the Imperial College Centre for Environmental Policy as well as co-chair of the working group uh, three for the intergovernmental panel on climate change a pleasure to meet you jim looking forward to talking to you and last 
but by no means least. Another newcomer to this set of climate talks, but certainly not a newcomer to climate talks. Welcome, Alison Campbell, who was the deputy lead negotiator at the COP26 climate summit. So thank you very much for your time, Alison. Right. So I'm going to be speaking with each panelist for a few minutes before we open up the conversation to a wider panel discussion. And also there will be some audience questions at the end as well. Now, I'd like to start with Wanjuhi Unjoroge. So Wanjuhi, thank you so much for your time, for being back here for the first and the last now as well. Let's start with the work of People Planet Africa. Now, your work helps organizations to be more environmentally sustainable. So just tell us, where do businesses go wrong? What can they do better? Um, thank you very much for having me. I'm happy to be back. And uh, to answer your question, and particularly on this side of the globe, the global south, our biggest challenge is a lack of technical know-how. Majorities of the majority of the companies on this side uh, exist in oblivion. They don't even know of the climate crisis, and that's a major problem. But then we have the multinationals that have decided to take the route of busybody. They want to be seen to be doing something to mitigate against the climate threat, um, to be existing or doing their businesses sustainably. But the honest truth is that they're doing nothing and they have the ability, they have the technical know-how, they have the money, they can be able to do their services and carry out their businesses sustainably, but they choose not to because they don't want to uh, go the, 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 the longer route. They want the shortcut that is uh, more harmful to the environment. So I'd say that's the biggest challenge. And um, I'm more patient with those who do not know about the climate threat. I'm, I'm, I'm more patient with those who lack the technical know-how. But I'm very, very uh, unapologetic and, and very direct with those who insist on being uh, busybodies. <laughs> and it's been 10 months now since you spoke at the opening event in the Climate Talk series. Tell us about the work that you've done since then in this year of COP26. I, I think I've done a lot of work, but um, the most significant has got to be joining active politics. Um, we are going into general election next year. And the honest truth is that what I've come to appreciate is that policy is part of, is a key part of uh, realizing uh, the COP26 commitments. Um, and for us to do that, we need people who are conscious, who have the interest of the planet and the people at heart in parliament where these policies are passed. Uh, Kenya was the first country in Africa to pass the Climate, Act, Climate Change Act in 2016, but this policy has never been implemented. Um, we have uh, policies that were passed in the 90s that allowed indigenous community, quote unquote, you know, you have people who are no members of the indigenous communities, for instance, who sold their properties and moved into the forest, claiming to be indigenous communities. And what has followed is massive destruction of one of the key water towers called the Mao uh, complex. And so I have made a deliberate decision to be to join very active politics. It's a, it's a very new world for me, but um, I, I think I'm ready for it. And I think that will be the most significant thing I have done in 2021 and going into 2022. Yeah, sounds like a really fantastic work there and a, and a different direction as well, and you he. Um, let's talk a little bit about COP26. Part of the point of this talk is to see what happens next. But before we move on to that, the event itself, do you feel that Kenya as a nation, Africa as a continent, was well represented at COP26? Were the concerns of the continent listened to? And do you feel like they're going to be acted upon? Mm. Uh, to be honest, uh, I think it was great representation from Africa and the global south. I, I really enjoyed listening to some of the speeches, um, like the one delivered by Mia, uh, but then the challenge with the side of the Sahara is that once we leave COP26, we sit and wait until the next COP, and then we rush last minute. And I feel for us on this side of the Sahara, because we're on the front line, uh, we are vulnerable to the climate crisis. I think we need to be more deliberate and to work together as a team. And this has to be the global south. 
because if we are to push the global north to deliver on their commitments, we can't do it alone. It has to be team effort to realize this. So what we listened to, I'm not sure we were listening to. Um, we had great representation, and I fear that we're going to sit down until the next COP, um, and then we'll be back there again. Uh, so I think there's, there's a, I'm not too optimistic about COP26, unfortunately. Well, we'll talk a little bit more about that and open it up to the, the rest of the panel uh, a little bit later when due here. But just my final question. One thing that you, you, you mentioned there about the Global South acting individually and, and, and it's time for people to come together. Do you think that there is that, that intention to have a bit more of a joined up thinking so that there is a, a louder, heavier voice in the talks about climate change from countries on the individual scale? No, 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 there is not that. Um, we have very many conflicting challenges, um, especially when you think about mm. Africa, that climate change tends to be a last thought. Uh, unless there is floods, unless there are locusts that have invaded our continent, we react instead of pre preventing. And so I don't think the continent, even let alone the global south, the continent itself is willing to come together to discuss the challenge of climate change. And I hope the, the ministers who are uh, environment ministers, and I know there's an umbrella body that brings them together, uh, will really act upon this. And this is why I'm saying for me, we, we hunger for leaders who really appreciate the climate threat and who know the urgency for this. Yeah. Well, this is why we have talks like this one, Juhi, so that those sorts of uh, thoughts and sentiments are, are out there for people to actually take to heart. Thank you, Wanjuhi, and uh, we'll come back to you shortly. But now we're going to turn our uh, attention to our next panellist from Imperial College, Professor Jim Skier. Welcome, Jim. Um, tell us first hi. of all, hi there. Tell us first of all your role as co-chair of the IPCC Working Group the, the Three. Uh, what does that group actually do? What are you reporting on? How important are those IPCC reports in shaping efforts to curb climate change here? Right, okay, I mean, so IPCC's job is to report every six or seven years and produce a very comprehensive assessment of what is known about climate change and also what is known about how you can respond to it, whether it's by adapting or, or mitigating. So the working group three that I'm co-chair of, along with my colleague Priyadarshi Shukla from Ahmedabad in India, is uh, focused on mitigation, which means reducing emissions or increasingly looking at ways of getting carbon dioxide out of the out of the atmosphere. So we produce a fairly comprehensive report that covers individual sectors of the economy like energy, industry, transportation, agriculture, forestry and land use. Uh, but we're increasingly paying a lot of attention to cross-cutting issues like, for example, finance, uh, technology transfer and capacity building, which I think we've heard about just a little bit already in the conversation. So it's a very broad ranging report. And I have to say, how you do it is critical. It's not the two of us doing it together. Uh, there are two co-chairs. There are seven vice chairs from all over the world. We have a technical support unit, which for us is split between London and Ahmedabad in India, to about a dozen people. And then we have 250 authors from all over the world that we're trying to get to collaborate to produce the report. And believe me, it has been a pretty tough process with COVID in the background to do all that thing virtually across different time zones. I'm pleased to say we got the final draft of our next report to governments at midday on Monday, as we promised, and we're going towards an approval session at, in late March is, is the current plan at the moment, where the governments go through the summary for policymakers line by line. So it's a very, very elaborate process we go through. But I think at the end of the day, but because it's gone through that process, it's really trusted because of the level of consensus that, 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 that's been built up. And, you know, I, I won't go through all the details, but the first IPCC report was critical for the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change itself. It came before the, the, the establishment of the convention. The second report led to the Kyoto Protocol, and the fifth report was really one of the precursors for the Paris Agreement. 
And we've done some very influential reports since then, the special report on warming of 1.5 degrees and the Working Group 1 physical science report this summer, uh, you know, which was the Code Red for Humanity report that uh, caught a lot of attention. Yeah, I'm uh, just thinking about the the huge video conferences you've got of about 160 odd people, and uh, I, I imagine they're quite difficult to uh, to chair in some situations as well. But no, it sounds like you're doing some fantastic work there, Jim. Mm. Um, so tell us, your area of expertise in this is sustainable energy, and you've held numerous important posts, including research director of the UK Energy Research Council, Research Council UK's. Um, Energy Research Council. So let me ask you about sustainable energy here. How confident can we be that energy companies are serious when it comes to having a green transition, uh, when we can see new fossil fuel operations being developed, being upscaled constantly around the world? How serious can we see that actually turning to green energy in the not so distant future? Well, that, that was a good question because you've puffed me up scientifically. Then you've asked me to speculate on the motivations of a, of a set of countries. So let me answer this question uh, you, you know, quite carefully. Uh, the, the energy sector isn't all the same. And you can actually see quite a lot of movement already in some parts of it. And I'd say the electricity sector is where things are starting to move. Because in many parts of the world, you're seeing renewable energy come onto the system at scale. And it's actually changing the fundamental business model of many of the companies that, that are involved there. So there, I think you're starting to see some movement. It's not, uh, it needs to spread more widely, but it's happening. Um, the, the question of, uh, uh, you know, are companies getting serious about it? To turn it around, it's getting serious for some companies because we've seen some major coal companies going into administration because of loss of markets and loss of prices. So again, it's starting to make a difference. And that controversial issue of the phase down or the phase out of coal that was in the Glasgow Pact, of course, is something that really touches on that. I think the interesting one is actually the oil, the oil and the oil and gas sector because there you can see some some companies paying a lot more attention to some of the ways that they might participate in a net zero carbon economy you know for example by contributing to things like carbon capture and storage and hydrogen production where the skills in the current industry could be redeployed but on the other hand we are seeing uh, the, the fact that uh, you know new oil and gas is being developed, although the International Energy Agency said in a report that came out earlier this year that basically if we're limiting warming to one and a half degrees, there's no more oil that needs to be developed. So you know I think it's a, it's a patchy picture, but you know overall things are beginning to change. I think. Okay, it's good to know. And and one element that we haven't actually touched upon yet: uh, greenhouse gas removal. Um, how important is that going to be to achieve net zero as well? Um, also, is it actually achievable in your opinion at scale? Well, 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 just to say, I mean, it's mostly carbon dioxide uh, that, that you would take, carbon, di carbon dioxide removal. Uh, and, you know, the, the messages you know, from all the scenarios that IPCC has assessed in the 1.5 report, you do need to take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere because there are some kinds of, um, you, you know, sources where it's pretty difficult to avoid the emissions. Things like aviation, some parts of industry are really quite avoid. Therefore, you need carbon dioxide removal to compensate to get so-called net zero emissions, which would stabilize, uh, stabilize global warming. But the other thing is carbon dioxide removal techniques are just huge. I mean, th there isn't one technique. There are hugely different ways of doing it. And some of them, particularly related to land use and forestry, are actually quite mature and are happening already. And they can happen at scale. Though just a little warning about the implications for things like food security, biodiversity and, and ecosystem services. But there are other techniques that are more engineering rather than biological uh, that you know, in which more research is being done at the moment from direct direct air capture of carbon dioxide and subsequent storage, for example. Uh, mm. So the message is, yes, it can be done at scale, whatever at scale means. Let, let's hope it's not sort of gigatons and gigatons of carbon dioxide. But how you do it really matters. What kind of crops, where you do it, what kind of management practices go in are absolutely critical. 
Thank you very much, Jim. Right, let's speak to Alison Campbell, Deputy Lead Negotiator for COP26. Evening, Alison. Great to have you with us. Um, first of all, tell us about your role at COP26. I'm so curious myself as well. Um, you know, what did it entail as the negotiations, the important conversations that we all saw and all heard about between nations were happening across the year, not only at the conferences as well, aren't they? Yeah, good afternoon, Kasa. It's nice to uh, be here with you. Um, yeah, so as deputy lead negotiator, it, it was my job essentially to work with my negotiations team and with, with countries around the world to, to work out like, firstly what outcomes we needed to deliver at COP26 and then secondly to develop a strategy for delivering them. Um, and as you've said, it's not just about the two weeks at COP itself. It was actually 18 months in the making. You know, we were dealing with some really big political issues um, and we had to think about how we could use each moment, each milestone in the run up to COP to make progress. So, for example, we made sure that we spoke to every single country to work out what their priorities were and to build relationships, which are really important in this process. Um, the COP president, Alok Sharma, he travelled to many countries to speak face to face with ministers. Um, we organised a number of virtual meetings at negotiator level, physical meetings at ministerial level, um, just to really bring people together to make progress on, on key political issues. And we also made sure that climate was, was top of the agenda at the leader level, um, including through a climate summit that we organised at the end of last year and our G7 presidency. And all of these things were, were needed to get the politics and the technical work in the right place ahead of COP. Um, and then the two weeks of COP itself um, was obviously a particularly intense period um, for me. Um, and my main job during that time was to, was to lead our work negotiating the Glasgow Climate Pact. Um, and that involved kind of constantly talking to countries, um, making sure we got the balance right um, in you know, the overall outcomes that we were putting on the table. Um, and it led to a lot of, of late nights like for me and for my yeah. team. I can't imagine you got much sleep during those two weeks there, um, but uh, we, could, we could leave that for now. <laughs> um, no, those people at home who are, who are watching this right now might have heard about COP26 in the news, um, but not necessarily much else about it or, or actually know what actually happens there as well. So can you just for a couple of minutes just explain how it works, what the format is and what happens over those two really crucial weeks? Sure. I mean, it's very difficult to explain how a COP works. I, I've been uh, yeah. eight COPs now, I think, and I'm not quite sure that I fully understand how they work. But it, but it's essentially it's, it's a two week meeting that happens every year where 197 countries come together essentially to make decisions on what they will do to tackle climate change. So it's a big, important moment in the year. Um, you work to a set agenda that that's basically um, based on issues that have been agreed at previous COPs as areas for discussions and all countries have to agree to that agenda before the meeting can even be started. Um, you then spend a week doing a lot of technical work on, on a whole range of issues from, for example, the rules around how carbon markets should function and how countries should report their emissions data to how you know a new finance goal should be set. And, there are a number of negotiating rooms that are running at any one time in parallel. So you see a lot of people running around uh, the place um, constantly kind of on the go um, and countries work together towards agreed decision text that sets out mm. what needs to be done in the future. And, and that all continues into the second week, but then it, it becomes a lot more political um, because by this point you usually have ministers there um, and it really distills into the kind of key political issues around, for example, what a country is going to do to reduce emissions further. Um, how are we going to support developing countries to to adapt to climate change? So um, as presidency, you have the license to pull these political issues together into into what's known as kind of cover decisions, which which tend to sit on top of the whole COP outcome and, and address the really political um, issues um, and which in our case was called the Glasgow Climate Pact. Um, and so you have all of these conversations going on, all of these documents that essentially need to be agreed together at the end of the meeting um, as a package and all countries have to agree to them for, for it to be adopted. So it's a really difficult process to navigate. Um, it's intense and it, and it can be, you know, high emotion, uh, but it is one that ensures that everyone uh, from the major economies to the smallest countries have a say, which is important. Um, and it's also, it's worth saying, it's the biggest summit actually that the UK has ever hosted. Um, we had 120 world leaders and 38,000 attendees. So 
um, it's a pretty big undertaking over that two week period. Yeah, and um, I was one of those people there, and uh, yeah, it was just the scale of it was uh, was awe inspiring actually as well. Um, you mentioned the Glasgow Climate Pact. I, I will touch upon that in a moment because that is something that I want to know what happens now going forward with that. But uh, just on on the role of of Glasgow and and the host country now as well, um, you also play a massive event, uh, role in this delegation as well of nations, don't they? Through talks and and we saw how. Uh, emotional Alok Sharma was about about the outcome as well. So just 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 tell us how much went into it from the UK's perspective into ensuring that this came out with some sort of positive change when it comes to climate change. Yeah, I mean the, the host country has a really important role in this process, and it's it's actually a really difficult one to navigate because you're expected to have an overall vision for what the talks need to achieve and and to so show leadership and set the agenda. But that also needs to be grounded in your understanding of what other countries want, because ultimately you're, you're working for them and um, you're working for the mo those most vulnerable to climate change. Um, and so you, you have to put aside your, your own national position, if you like. So we didn't go with a UK national position. We went to represent the countries and to try and bring them together as a neutral broker you know, between countries that really have very different circumstances and therefore a wide range of views you know, from the small island states to, to China, to the United States, and, and bring them all together to achieve an outcome. And that's really your role. So it's a lot of listening. It's a lot of understanding perspectives and trying to work out where the balance lies, um, not, not just at the meeting itself, but through the whole kind of year beforehand. Um, and it's important also um, to, to involve civil society, indigenous peoples, the youth business. I mean, everybody has a stake in this. So it, it's it's actually a very big task to try and bring together all of those range of views. And there's, there's a lot of expectations on your shoulders. Um, and we were presidency at a critical time. It was the year in which countries were expected to, to raise their ambition and to reduce their emissions further. Um, and we, we took a view very early on that we wanted to be a, a kind of unapologetically uh, ambitious presidency. And we, and we set a goal, goal of keeping 1.5 degrees in reach. Um, and we decided that we'd push for high ambition across the piece on emissions reductions, on, on getting the finance in the right place. And we did a lot of work through our diplomatic network. So it, it, it wasn't just our central team that was working on this. It was the whole of the, the foreign office and um, engaged countries. Um, and we felt that as long as we were balanced um, and we were pushing everybody, uh, we had the license to do that. And I think it led to mm. us getting the outcomes that we did, uh, particularly through the Glasgow Climate Pact. Yeah, 1.5 alive, I, I recall being one of the one of the phrases that came out of it. So tell us about the Glasgow Climate Pact then. What was an, an overview of it, if you, if you can? What does it mean for the fight against climate change? What's going to happen now in the wake of the meeting? Yes, yeah, so the Glasgow Climate Pact was, was a very important part of the outcome because it was the place where, if you like, we were able to go beyond some of the important mandates we had been given, like dealing with some of the technical work to close off final bits of negotiations on carbon markets, et cetera, and to set out how we were really going to address the big gaps in ambition um, that we can see um, on, on you know, emissions reductions, um, on helping countries um, deal with the impacts, on loss and damage and on finance. And, and I mentioned before, we had the very clear objective to keep 1.5 in reach. And it, and it was always our view that this would have to be dealt with at a political level um, and that we could only achieve this through an ambitious cover decision that accelerated action over the next decade. Um, and I think it's important to say we, we always knew we were never going to be able to solve all of these problems in one meeting. Um, you know, we've heard the gaps that exist. We, we, but what we needed to do was show both the commitment of countries to addressing these gaps and, and clear, clear processes for doing that. And that is essentially what the, the cover decision did. Um, we took the decision that we would put down a text that was ambitious. Um, I think it went beyond what some of these texts normally do because we felt that the politics was in the right place and we had the support of countries to do that. And it was what the world was calling for. So by taking that approach, we, we got a number of big outcomes in the Glasgow Climate Pact. So for example, we got political commitment to, to delivering on 1.5 and, and, and increasing ambition over the next decade. Um, I think crucially we got a request in that decision to come back next year and revisit and strengthen 2030 mm -hmm. targets and to put net zero commitments on the table. 
we got um, commitment to coal phase down, fossil fuel subsidy phase out, and that was the first time these issues have ever been addressed in negotiated text in the UN, quite, uh, you know, so, <laughs> surprisingly. Yeah, lots. Um, so, yeah, yeah and, loads and we there. also... Yeah, just oh, finally to Thank say, we, we also got a number yeah, go of things that um, that delivered also on for developing country support for adaptation, um, financial support, and and funding for uh, lost and damage. So, what that means from our perspective is that the world's committed to taking the action we need to see, and and the key test will be whether these commitments are actually followed through um, by increased action um, in you know the next year and beyond. Thank you so much, Alison. As it's been really great listening to, to you talk a little bit about that. I'd like to now uh, speak to uh, Mina Cunningham-Kane, who joins us from Nicaragua, Chair of the Fund for Development of Indigenous Peoples of Latin America and Caribbean as well. Mina, great to talk to you again. Um, I wanted to start actually about the climate impacts of the Indigenous peoples that you represent across various nations. Who are the worst affected how are they affected? Who is most at threat here from further worse climate impacts? Thank you. Thank you very much for having me on this panel. And greetings from my people, the Miskito Indigenous Nation of Nicaragua. We are more than 5 thousand indigenous nations or peoples in the in 90 countries in the world and although we have the smallest environmental impact footprint yet we are the most affected by climate impacts and extreme weather events indigenous peoples are at the forefront of the environmental crisis receiving these impacts on our land, territories, and resources, and therefore on our ways of life. Extreme weather events have been increasingly rapid, leaving us with very limited scope to respond effectively to these exchange, these changes. For example, I'm from the North Atlantic region, the Caribbean region, and in my region where I live, in November last year, was impacted by two hurricanes of category four and five respectively in a span of less than 10 days between each event. There were communities that were completely destroyed. And we have seen that due to the increase in, in temperature, there have been large fires in regions such as the Amazon or Siberia affecting the way of life of people that who live in them. We know from the indigenous peoples of the Arctic that the melting ice is also affecting the animal species that they use for their subsistence. Nomadic indigenous peoples in the Sahel region are affected by extreme droughts events. Indigenous Maasai in Kenya are affected by pests and droughts. And we can go on with many examples. So yes. it is important to note that the impact on indigenous peoples are significant in both developing and developed countries. And yeah. this is causing losses of life, land, and livelihood. And some of these damages are permanent. But I have to, I have to say that in the Glasgow Park, they acknowledge the important role of the broad range of stakeholders at different levels, but it failed to create a new damage fund for nations already negatively impacted by climate change. And this really affects us as indigenous people. Yeah, we will definitely talk about that in a few minutes time as well. I remember when I was actually there um, and there were lots of campaigns and and uh, activists outside and, and I spoke to people from the, the Mapuche in Chile talking about the fact that they were unable to to be at where their their ancestors were now so yeah the and, and there were many others as well from indigenous communities who had come all the way over uh, just to be really really uh, advocates and, and and talk about the use the platform to talk about the the situation they face and and that is something that that 
as chair of the FELAC or the Fund for Development of Indigenous Peoples of Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, you support these communities. You want to advocate for these people as well, don't you? Can you give us an overview of the organization's mission uh, and your objective? Sure. The FELAC is, a, is a, what we call is a unique organization because it combines in its governance, indigenous organizations and governments, member states. So we sit together and we try to find solutions that have to do with the life of indigenous peoples. The mission of PILAC is to support self-determined development of indigenous peoples. So what we do is that we try to build bridge, bridges between indigenous peoples and governments to address issues like climate change that we are discussing today, but also to address issues that are related with the model of development, with education, with health, with different issues. And during this year preparing for, for Glasgow, we held a lot of different preparatory meetings. We met with the, the presidency of COP25, but also with COP26. And we tried to bridge the different recommendations that came out from the previous COP and prepare with the global caucus of indigenous peoples, the position that we would take to COP26 on issues that are very important for indigenous peoples. But also we try to bridge between COP26, CBD, the summit on food, uh, food system, because we see all of these uh, events, these global events as very important to address the concept and the position of indigenous people. We also Thank have so different much. capacity building activities in different parts of the world. So that is part of our work. Mirna, thank you so much for explaining that to us. I'm going to now uh, bring in our fifth final speaker before we open this up now to the panel. I know you all want to talk to each other about this as well. So let's, let's bring in Radhika Khosla, Research Director of the Oxford India Centre for Sustainable Development. Evening, Radhika. Um, great to have you here again. Um, you talked last time you spoke, uh, but for the benefit of, of those watching at home who might not have uh, seen your previous uh, climate talk. Can you just recap briefly the work that you do as the director of the Oxford India Center for Sustainable Development? Thank you. Yeah, the work that um, I'm I'm focusing on and the center focuses on is um, is looking at the different challenges and opportunities that lie at the heart of India and sustainable development. For instance, how can we manage this tension between providing energy for the quality of life to countries in transition, but doing this while preserving the environment, both the local environment and the global environment, and doing this in contexts where climate change is often not a priority, as is the case in, in many developing countries. Now, um, one of the ways in which we're looking at this is by examining the future of cooling, which is, uh, is, is an interesting and often a blind spot in many of our energy and climate debates, but actually the, the world is going to face an unprecedented increase in energy demand for cooling. But at the same time, there will be billions of people who will not be able to have access to that cooling. Um, so working our way through those tensions is, is, is core to the work that the center does. There's also a lot of work on pathways to impact so how research from academia it, it, it touches sort of impact outside the academy. And the center also oversees the largest number of scholarships for Indian students at Oxford. Thank you for that. Now, I want to talk a little bit about India, India's role at COP26 as well. How important would you say India's pledges at COP26 were? For instance, the pledge to achieve net zero on carbon emissions by 2070, when we heard 2050 being the, the key year for it to happen. Uh, what, what else did they say or do at COP that we can give us a reason for, for optimism here or not? What would you say about that, Radhika? Yeah, so India was quite an active uh, player at the COP and uh, it was significant right from, from the beginning, from the plenary when uh, the prime minister made the, the net zero pledge 
of, of achieving net zero by 2070. And, um, you know, this was not really expected. It was not really expected domestically. It was not really expected internationally. And it did bring um, a level of reassurance to the international community when, when India made that pledge. It, of, it, it also, uh, you know, signals ambition, but also goes beyond what um, India would have done if it was acting from a place of equity. Um, and India has been quite, um, you know, it's been quite, strong in its views about uh, equitable commitments up to this point. And so it was really seen as a measure domestically, and, and I, I definitely think so, as a way in which India is, is working on contributing to that virtuous cycle of trust that the Paris Agreement has set up where every country does more and brings more to the table. Right? Um, in, in terms of your question of 2050 versus 2070, the Paris Agreement is actually quite clear that developing countries will peak later. Um, and, and so India's year is quite in line with that. China's year of pledging is, uh, of net zero pledging is, is 2060, as we know. So, so that was yeah. one pledge. But there were, but there were um, a couple of other important things that India also agreed to. Um, you know, and, and these are, in, in some sense, much more interesting because they're in the short term. So India agreed. 500 gigawatts of renewable energy by 2030, which is really, really large, um, and also 50% of fossil fuel free capacity by 2030. And this, these are important pledges, in some sense, more important than the than the net zero pledge because they lock in uh, short term actions that can actually deliver on those longer term goals. Now, the final piece that um, India was uh, was sort of known for and became famous for was advocating for the phrase of phase down of coal versus phase out of coal and inefficient fossil fuel subsidies. Um, the thing I'll say here is this was actually a phrase that came out of the US-China bilateral agreement. And it was a phrase that was rejected not just by India, the phase out was rejected not just by India, but by India, China, South Africa, and Nigeria. So, you know, taken together, I think, you know, strong commitment, ambition, and in line with principles of equity. Yeah, let's talk a little bit more about the um, renewable energy um, pledge there from India as well, because, you know, a lot of the narrative before has been about uh, the, uh, the fossil fuel consumption in places like India. But what can the world learn, would you say, from India as a producer of renewable energy, one of the world's largest emitters of CO2, as I've mentioned, but also now, this, as this proves, one of the largest uh, producers of clean energy as well. Yeah, so it's quite a remarkable story of, of renewable energy and solar energy in mm. particular. You know, between 2010 and 2018, renewable energy solar costs dropped by 80%. So just in eight years, they dropped by 80%. In 2010, um, the price of solar was around 17 rupees per unit. And it's now closer to two, a little more than two rupees per unit. And it, it's made India the cheapest producer of solar power globally. So that's, a, you know, that's sort of a, 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 a big accomplishment and quite quickly, it's, it's been possible because of these different public private partnership models, um, a lot of aggressive target setting by the government um, and, and an implementation uh, of that target to, you know, to a, to a significant extent. So initially, India's solar uh, pledge or solar target internally was 20 gigawatts by 2022. When our prime minister, the new prime minister came to power, uh, the pledge was changed from 20 gigawatts in 2022 to 100 gigawatts in 2022. At Glasgow, the pledge is 500 gigawatts of renewable energy by 2030. Um, there was a lot of competitive tariff-based bidding that has enabled that. I will say, though, that currently India is about, at about 47 gigawatts out of that 100 and, and 500. And, um, you know, it really remains to be seen what the pace of increase will be over this decade and how renewables will be integrated into the broader energy system. Um, that trajectory is not, um, is, is not straightforward. No. Radhika, thank you very much. In fact, thank you to, to all of our panelists uh, so far tonight for your all your really unique, interesting perspectives. It's now quarter past eight, so I want to open this up 
to the whole panel actually to have a little chat to each other as well so welcome back to you all onto the screen and um yeah looking forward to talking to you all so in this section um we're going to talk for about half an hour or so and i'm going to direct uh, specific questions towards the speakers but also please don't be shy you're all here you're all experts if there is anything that you would like to to add in then um please do so as well and uh, Let's make a nice conversation of it all. Uh, but um, I've been holding off basically about asking this first question, but it's the first question that's always come to my mind really. And now that I've got you all on screen together, I'm just gonna throw it out there actually. And I'd like you all to, to give us your thoughts. Was COP26 a success? Was it a failure? Was it something in between? I know we heard from Wanjuha earlier, pretty categorically saying it wasn't. So would anyone else like to pick up on on that point there, do you think it was a success? Can I, I di dive in and the, the, this may be and, and have a go to it? I mean, just to say whether you judge it as a success or not depends a bit on what your expectations were from the outcome. And I do think that if you call it a complete failure, you're actually setting the bench, rather, the, the hurdle rather high in terms of judging success or failure. In fact, I would rather characterise as not as success in the singular, but success in the plural, because actually there were so many elements to it, I think, as Alison was kind of saying. So we got the Glasgow Pact signed. I mean, that was that, that, that was a major success to get the, the, the Glasgow Pact actually agreed. There were many side agreements uh, that were actually done there on things like methane and the just transition partnership with, Af with, with, with South Africa was a critical one and it's very technical and very boring but all of the work done on the so-called article 6 and finishing the Paris rule book was incredibly important as well but the big if we call it delicately maybe challenges uh, remaining to be met uh, there were issues like for example the financial flows from developed to developing countries the so-called 100 billion uh, the target is 2023 hasn't got there by 2020 just to say, I deliberately mentioned that first before the uh, before the next one, which is obviously the fact that the emissions pledges do not add up to 1.5 degrees at the moment by quite a long way. Uh, they're getting close to the zone of two degrees, but they're still not even there yet. So there is more to be done, you know, in terms of the keeping 1.5 alive agenda. Wanjuha, well, I want to bring you back in on this because, um, sorry, no, Mirna, you wanted to come in, please do so. Yes, I would just like to add that in the conversation in, in August, I say that it was very important to have the participation of indigenous peoples at COP26. And this is something that we were able to work together with the presidency to search for options for an effective participation in the negotiations. Of course, we are not part of member states, so our space of negotiation is different, but there were a lot of spaces of, for dialogue on important issues for us, such as nature-based solution, the issue on access to climate finance. And at the same time, there was also in the document some important aspects related with indigenous people's rights, the human rights-based approach, and, and, and recognizing the role that indigenous peoples have to have play in, in climate uh, solutions. And of course, there are things that we, we are not happy with, but for example, on the article six on market and non-market mechanism for emissions trading, we believe that we should be actively and effectively involved in the process. And although it, addresses the, the issue of human rights and um, the issue of free, prior and informed consent was not included specifically. But we do hope that the, 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 the arrangement and the agreements we made with a COP26 presidency will we continue for COP27 presidency to improve indigenous people's participation. How do you feel about that, Alison, and, um, and, and me and his thoughts there? More glass half full. <laughs> yes, well, I mean, we would certainly say that I think judged against everything it could reasonably have been expected to deliver. Um, COP26. COP yes. 
think um, we may have lost Alison for a moment, so we will try and get Alison's comments there because that is something I definitely want to hear. But I know Radhika actually uh, wanted to also come in as well. Radhika, what do you yeah, want to add on? Quickly. Yeah, yeah, just quickly. I mean, I think like it's been said, neither triumph nor train wreck, right? So we're yeah. so so it's a, a, a bit of both. And in addition to what has already been said about the Paris rule book, um, I do think the the mechanism of coming back with more ambitious pledges next year is another is another thing that did work well because it sort of you know it, it keeps the momentum up and also then um, the pro setting up a process for a goal towards global um, adaptation. Um, on, on the flip side, you know, the sort of lack of concrete measures on loss and damage and on finance um, have, have not been uh, up to the mark. But I think the, the real issue is that just in terms of gigatons of reductions needed, you know, we need something from 23 to 27 gigatons and the, the Glasgow pledges get us to about four gigatons of reduction. So we're quite far away. Um, from 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 the you know from where we need to be. Is this something that um, Radhika? Um, it's all about the expectations here, as uh, as Jim was talking about. If you if your expectations are that this is going to be the silver bullet to sort everything out, I mean, I know this was talked about by John Kerry as the last best chance, um, but taking it away from that polarizing view that this is the only time to to be able to save the planet. Um, what do you think about that, Radhika? And, and I'll ask, I'll get, get your answer very quickly before we go back to, to Alison. But yeah, what, what do you think? Is it important to manage expectations here or sh should we actually be looking at things in such a black and white term that we need to, to hit these uh, markers straight away? Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's correct to say that the negotiations don't solve everything, and that should not be the expectation of them. It's often the conversations around them, like a lot of things we've heard about that 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 help. Um, the fact of the matter, though, is that the gap between where we need to be and where we are is is really large. Um, and so, while expectations might, you know, are unreasonable to think that the negotiations will get us there a hundred percent. The fact that we're, you know, not even 50% there, um, I do think is not just a matter of expectation, it is also a matter of not having acted. Alison, thank you so much. Um, welcome back as well. Um, now, I know you worked incredibly hard across not just COP26, but you, your team, everybody involved, you know, for, for a number of months to try and get this sorted as well. And, and I'm sure you did everything that you can to try and get everybody together. But I wanted to ask you, how, how do you feel when we have people here saying that the gap here is still too large or more needed to be done? Well, look, I mean, I, I agree with, with many of the comments that have been made. I think, you know, just against everything it could reasonably have been expected to deliver, COP26 was a success. I think we made real progress, um, more than some may have expected. And I think I'd highlight three key areas of that. I mean, I think first, in terms of the commitments that were made going into COP, um, especially around the World Leaders Summit and before that, you know, we now have 90% of the global economy that's under net zero commitments, which was up from 30% um, at the start of our COP presidency. We saw a number of countries increase their 2030 targets. Um, you know, and we heard from Radhika about, you know, how India did that at the summit itself. And, and, and the projected temperature rise is now closer to or below two degrees, depending on which study you look at, um, from around three degrees after Paris. So, so progress was made. Um, I think secondly, through the Glasgow Climate Pact, you know, a number of people have talked about the various gaps. I think we acknowledge those. We said we are not where we need to be on emissions reductions. We're not where we need to be in supporting uh, countries deal with the impacts in finance, in loss and damage. But we made commitments to, to take those forward and to, and to close those gaps um, next year and beyond. And then finally, we, we finalised some of the key rules needed to implement the Paris Agreement, which haven't been resolved for the past six years. So I think that combined with the fact that we actually saw the emergence of a new way of doing things. So, for example, I think a good example of that is the support to South Africa for their transition away from coal, like the new model of a just transition, which I think needs to be built upon. Um, so I think, you know, some really um, big elements that came out, what it didn't do and it could never be expected to do is, is solve the climate crisis in one go. And I think that's what um, all of the speakers here have said. And, and the important thing is what happens from here. 
you know, whether countries are prepared to deliver on the commitments that they made in Glasgow and increase their ambition. Um, and, and also, you know, really importantly, um, how we do that in involving the Indigenous peoples um, and in all of the people who will be impacted by this and making sure that they are com they continue to be part of both the conversation and, and the solution. So um, I think that that's how I would frame it. Thank you. One Juha, just want to bring you back in on this now, because right at the start, I mean, you set this up yourself. Mm. My worry is a shift in goalposts. So when we commit to 100 billion by 2020, and then we say 2023, what are the consequences of not uh, delivering on these commitments? Are there any consequences? Or shall we again shift the goalposts to 2025, 2026? Are there any consequences? And I think for me, this is where the hopelessness comes in. Uh, because unless there are consequences for not delivering, we'll keep shifting uh the goalposts and then i go back to my earlier words um that the global south has to come together for us to achieve or to realize uh any tangible outcome from all the commitments that are made uh, it's also important to say that for me as a kenyan to hold my country accountable to the commitment they've made i need to be aware of the contents of the Paris agreement so this document seems to be something that's completely unknown and removed from the youth who are the majority uh, in Africa, for instance. So how do we dissect this and, 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 and circulate it to um, the masses so that they can hold each government accountable? I think that's the only way we're going to make progress. Even for the global north, I think the youth and the civil society has a responsibility to hold these countries accountable to the commitments they make, especially on financing um, the global south. Thank you for that. Now, Myrna, I want to ask you a question to start with on this one. Um, do you think the voices of those in developing nations, particularly the global south, as all of our speakers have been talking about, um, you know, who we know are and will continue to be the worst affected here by climate change, do you think they were adequately listened to at COP? Well, considering that COP26 presidency said it would be the most inclusive COP, it is unfortunate that this that did not happen. If we see the majority of delegations, the majority of participation were from the global north. And um, so the, this difference also affected the negotiation and that is why we heard the voices of representatives and delegates from developing countries in frustration. In Latin America, we even saw some of them crying in when they were, they were telling to their, their countries what happened in relation to how the negotiations were progressing and the agreements that were reached. We saw, for example, that the commitment reached during the COP were limited, especially on the issue of protecting communities identified as vulnerable and suffering the greatest effect. It has been mentioned, we saw this discussion on climate finance and, and we also the, the, saw the discussion on phasing out fossil fuel use and the finance for loss and damage adaptation and mitigation. So there, although there is a spirit of compromise, that was left in the decision to phase down rather than eliminate things. So we do believe that we have, as, as it has been said, we have to see the delivering of the commitments, but developing countries really did not have the same opportunities to speak at what the What do you think about COVID, that, Alison? They were not well, um, we, we made it a priority of our presidency to, to ensure that the, the voices of the most vulnerable were heard. And, and um, I think, you know, we said the whole way through, we, we, our aim was to deliver for the most vulnerable. Um, I do think this was reflected both in the run up to COP, where the COP president made sure that he focused his visits in the global south. He spoke to all constituencies. He got out to, I think, all of the regions apart from the Pacific, which wasn't possible because of the travel restrictions around COVID-19. I and mean, then at COP itself, we made sure you know, that all groups felt engaged and we made an effort to listen to everybody. 
Um, I personally was in close contact with the small island states and the least developed country groups at, at all times during COP. Um, and I do think that you know this was reflected in the outcomes where where we advocated strongly for adaptation for loss and damage um, and, and for finance as well as keeping 1.5 in reach. I mean, obviously, though, it's it, those in the global south who can best answer that question. I think we made every effort to engage. Ultimately, you know, we are, we had to come to compromise. Um, you know, where there were different perspectives, um, and and it, you know, the, all the countries have to agree on the outcome. But but we certainly made an effort to ensure um, that they that all the voices were heard because I think that's one of the most important parts of the UNFCCC process. Yeah, Radhika, I suppose you're in a very unique position here, uh, given your uh, role. What would you say were those uh, you know, countries in the developing South, uh, the global South, developing countries, were they, were they heard, do you feel, and listened to at COP? Yeah, I, I think Alison is right that, you know, every effort was made. Um, I, I think the flip side is that, you know, that, that vulnerable countries were left feeling immensely disappointed, particularly for uh, because the loss and damage facility was blocked by the, by the U US and the EU. Um, and the sort of lack of being able to deliver on this finance commitment that has been so many years in the making, um, you know, it, it, it sort of really left the countries feeling, you know, feeling like their goals were not being listened to and heard. And I think even more broadly, just in terms of responsibility, because these are not, these are, these are sort of groups that are the most vulnerable, but also the least responsible. And there is a sense that richer nations have failed to stay below the 1.5 degree mark. Yeah, thank you. So Jim, what happens next then after COP26? What would you say? What work now uh, must happen? Uh, must be the aim of COP27 in Egypt next year, Jim. Well, well, I mean, just to say, I see this from a, from a slightly selfish point of view because the Glasgow Pact has multiple references to IPCC in it on the kind of expectations that are coming out. So our working group two on impacts, adaptation and vulnerability will come out in February. Mitigation will come out in March and that will feed into the midterm meeting in Bonn in June. Uh, to carry the process forward. And it's quite important to remember that uh, the, global, the, the global stock take envisaged under the Paris Agreement has now started, and IPCC is actually one of the major, major uh, sort of sources of information that's expected to feed into that, you know, to see whether the goals of the Paris Agreement are actually being achieved with this. So this is something that we've got our, our mind on for the overall process. Our synthesis report should come out in September, and that should feed into COP27 in Sharm el-Sheikh. It's worth saying, I think, that, uh, well, Alison is better on, we're going to be much better on this than me, than me, but not all COPs are equal, as it were. You know, Paris was a major, major, major milestone, and COP26 had been the biggest milestone since Paris. But other COPs, important as they are, tend to be a more on kind of routine progress. I think the big one for Sharm el-Sheikh and COP27 has been to see what other pledges countries will come up to up their game, given what was submitted at COP26. And that is something, you know, that our input to the global stock take should help address. Can I just say one thing on all these net zero targets, uh, which is something that... Um, uh, we will be asked about in the global stock take. You need to read the fine print very carefully if there is fine print at all on them, because China's net zero is for carbon dioxide only, and greenhouse gas net zero will come probably about a decade later. So whatever the, the Indian target is, it might be the same as the Chinese one. Read the small print before you actually get there. Mm -hmm. I have to say, nobody that I've spoken to knows what the, what the Indian net zero is, but maybe Radhika can tell us a bit more. Yeah, I think you did, Radhika, didn't you, in, in that sense as well? Right, yeah, Alison, I mean, what work is, you've worked so much, uh, spent, dedicated a whole year to COP26. What happens now in the lead up to COP27? What work will you and the others be doing to ensure that the pledges that were made at COP26 are going to carry on? Well, I think as, as I and others have said um, on this panel, uh, in many ways, the success of Glasgow will be measured by what happens next um, and how we follow through on, on the processes that were put in place and the commitments that were made. So, you know, for example, the commitment to come back 
to, to, to revisit and strengthen the 2030 targets, the NDCs, to put forward long-term strategies to net zero, to deliver on the 100 billion finance, um, to get the Santiago network on loss and damage um, up and running, and to begin the work on the, the global goal and adaptation. Uh, th th there are many things, many really important things kind of leading through Sharm El Sheikh next year. So I think, um, and I, I agree with, with Jim that, you know, the, the COPs are not all equal, but I actually think we're moving into a cycle now where they are also, because of the amount that needs to be done and because we have to act so urgently, each COP is its own important milestone. So COP27 is, is going to be vital. Um, we've got very good working relationships with the Egyptian team. And they have a very good team um, and we'll be working very closely with them. And obviously they'll need to set their own agenda and put their own stamp on it. Um, but the UK presidency will, will be there to support them in doing that. And of course, um, we will be focusing on delivering on the things that, that we set in train in Glasgow as well. Thank you for that. Right, Mirna, I've got a question for you. How, how confident are you that the that the largest global players, nations such as the US, China, India, Brazil, UK, that they're gonna stick to these commitments that they have uh, that they put their names to. How confident are you that, that they're gonna be able to to continue down this path? Uh, we don't have any confidence, I would say. I, I, oh. I have to say that clearly. We we have seen so many commitments in the past and of course, if you look at Brazil, Brazil is, is, it has been the worst last years for indigenous peoples in Brazil. It's one of the countries where we have the highest rate of criminalization against indigenous peoples. And we have been able to, to uh, present evidence that whenever indigenous people's land rights are recognized and they have control over their territories, we have reduced deforestation, we have more biodiversity, we, have, we can practice our traditional knowledge system. So we have solution and we have been saying that in all of the different countries. So I, I think there were commitments, big commitment from these big, big states, but I don't see that it goes together with the respect of rights on indigenous peoples and vulnerable groups. If you commitment without respect and human rights based approach, it's no, there's no way to deliver. So I think we have to continue mobilizing the, the, the civil society, the local communities, and we have to work very hard in the next year to be able to push for these commitments to be respected. Well, uh, Wanjuhi, what would you say about that? Do you have confidence in this? I think, um, I don't want to answer this with a yes or no, but I think what I want to say is that what are the things that you're going to do between now and the next COP, that's the most important. And first is breaking down the commitments for regular people to understand. Because when we have more people with an understanding, then we will hold um, all these countries accountable. Only eventually be able to hold them accountable. Because I feel um, there's a lot of under lack of understanding uh, among the regular people. And this remains, something for a select few and that's very very dangerous i think it's extremely important that uh we become uh that we we we, we find ways of ensuring that everybody has an understanding and then we can, because this is the only way we are going to hold these countries accountable uh so it's extremely crucial that we find a way of ensuring that people actually understand what is happening uh only then shall we Sorry, Wendy, please do finish. No, 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 it's okay. Yeah, Alison, how, how can we hold states accountable then if they make these pledges and then they start to renege on them a little bit or, or don't meet the, 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 the targets that they've set themselves? Well, well, I actually think this is another really important thing that was agreed at COP26 that flies slightly under the radar, but we agreed on a transparency framework 
which sets out the rules for how countries are going to report on um, all of the commitments that they have made. Um, so when a country says it will do something um, in its NDC and it, and it sends that to the to the UN, then you know there will, there will be a process um, of reporting on that, and everybody will be able to see very transparently whether or not that has been delivered. And I think ultimately, you know, as, as in all kind of these international processes, the, the biggest lever that, that you have on countries to deliver on what they've said that they're going to do is that transparency. And then it's the pressure from civil society groups, from the youth, from indigenous peoples. And I think that is the mechanism that we have to use to, to ensure that these commitments are, are followed through on. OK, um, let's talk a little bit about money now. Uh, Mark Carney, UN Special Envoy, for climate action and finance uh, stated at COP26 that $130 trillion has now been committed by the private sector to tackling climate change. I'd like to know, in your opinion, how significant a sum is this? And also, how does uh, the funding need to be spent going forward? And ultimately, who is best to spend it? Um, I'm going to ask Myrna, Wanjuhi and the others as well. But Jim, I'd like to come to you first of all uh, with your yeah. research uh, hat on. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, sure. I mean, that's the kind of sums of money that are needed, both for mitigation and for adaptation and resilience to get things going. And just to say, I mean, we can contrast it with 100 billion, you know, that kind of countries have pledged. The lot of that money is going to need to come from the, tr the private sector at just a vastly larger, larger scale. And it's quite clear that the money is there. Uh, the problem is getting the money to flow where it needs to go in order to deliver. And if we take the example, I mean, I know private funds who won't get up in the morning unless it's about 100 million is, is the kind of sum of the money that they're talking about. But we need money in the hundreds and thousands of dollars, uh, you know, to, to insulate uh, leaky houses in Glasgow or support farmers in the global south. And the trick is going to be how you kind of aggregate these projects and make sure that the money can flow effectively to go there. And that's one reason why the Article 6, you know, part of the Paris Agreement is quite important, because it's one of the mechanisms, if it is robust and it doesn't involve greenwash, that can actually help make the money flow as well and get these private sector funds going. So it's a huge, huge task, and we have an entire chapter on this in our next IPCC report on finance and investment, where the, clearly the biggest challenge is this how question. How do you actually make the money flow? The quantity, the money's there, just making it happen is the challenge. Wanjuhi, well, you started uh, to, to nod uh, quite a lot there when Jim was talking. What did you want to add on to this? I want to add the the money should also go to transition because I think the how do we move from the harmful practices to what is good is equally important. But then we need to move from commitment to actually having the money. And until then, I don't think we should be hopeful or should clap our hands. I think it's very dangerous. Um, but Alison talked about transparency. Uh, I also think when it comes to how the money is used, it's extremely important that we have transparency on eventually encourage more people uh, to continue giving uh, more money uh, into the climate crisis. So how, who gets the money then in, in your thoughts, Wanjuhi? Is it the, is it states and their governments? Is it individual private companies? Is it, is it charities? How, mm. how do we work with that money, Wanjuhi? You know, coming from uh, the side of the Sahara, I wouldn't say government, I would actually say the private sector. We, I think we need um, fund managers who are responsible for the money, uh, especially the money from the private sector. The private sector knows how to manage its money. Uh, I think I will keep it at private sector level. Um, the UN is not the best. It has its own flaws, but I would also say the UN. Uh, we've seen... Uh, 80% or maybe 70% of the impact. Uh, so I would also say the UN can also be trusted with the money. Uh, because I would feel bad when money reserved for climate crisis going into people's pockets. I think it would be really, really painful. Um, so I would say the private sector, uh, they can, for their money, I think they should come up with fund managers for it. Uh, the rest can go to, to, to bodies like the United Nations. Myrna, from yourself, who 
should be entrusted with the money? We heard at the beginning of the COP that there were $1.7 billion were going to be allocated for indigenous people's forests and land tenure. With many private organizations and states joining this commitment, the truth is that we have no idea what this means for indigenous peoples, especially because we hope that it really means that we will have direct access to the funds and no processes will be done through third parties. We know that through third parties until today, 1% of the funds that goes for climate change or for land reaches indigenous communities. So there is no clarity on the issue of how this money will reach the indigenous peoples. And there is also talk that in many cases, it will be done through the same mechanism that the state or financial mechanisms private actors already have, which could mean that we will not have direct access to the funds or that we will decide on them. We hope that this is, will not be the case. The other point is that we would like to clarify that on this issue, it's already, already related to whether this commitment is an additional commitment to the funds that the states already have for indigenous peoples or are the same funds that they define annually for indigenous peoples. There's also a pledge for 90 billion for nature-based solution. We say we have been doing that for history. Community-based solution, that's our special specialization. We have done that. The big question yeah. remains, what does this mean? And we have been saying, an indigenous organization mentioned that all throughout the COP. We can Thank establish you. mechanisms and we have them in place already. Thank you for that and being so assertive on it as well. Right. I'm going to go to some audience questions in a moment, actually. We've got we've got three. Very quickly, I, I want to talk about two of the, the largest countries, the two big players uh, here, the US and China. Um, Alison, I'll come to you in a moment just to just to give us a little bit of a peek behind the curtain at how difficult it was to to, to, to manage the two countries and their interests there. But, um, but Radhika, for yourself, what, what do you make of the, their performance at COP? How significant is it that the two nations are not exactly known for, for cozy relations? And, and what do you make of it? Or how important are, is their relationship going forward, Radhika? Yeah, I, I, you know, it, it is a really important relationship. I will say that just the US had to do a lot of work in terms of uh, undoing the the last few years um, and and uh, the the fact that this agreement this, uh, the climate pact welcomes the findings of the IPCC 1.5 degree report which um, in Paris there was pushback from the US for that so just acknowledging that that role um, and and the work that had to be done now now the relationship with China. Um, you know, there was this bilateral agreement that came out of the, they came from the two countries, which is not dissimilar to what happened in Paris. Um, and so it was nice to see that kind of, you know, the, the, the countries coming together and leading to different types of partnerships, capacity building, technology uh, transfer. But of course, what matters is how this implementation will take place. And that's yet to be seen how the implementation will happen in the different domestic context. Thank you. Right, Alison, I'll spare you on, on the US-China relations because we do need to go to some audience questions now as we are nearly out of time. So, uh, Alison, you're safe there. Anyway, Grace asks, how can we stop corporations carrying out polluting activities instead of cleaning up their ways? We want a world where health is valued higher than profits. I think, in other words, this means how do we put in place, basically, adequate incentives or indeed penalties to encourage businesses to prioritize environmental sustainability. Um, yeah, so one, one Julie, I'm gonna come on to this. What's the right way, incentives or punishments? What would you say? The radical, the radical way. I think we are tired, I'm personally very tired of begging corporations that have the ability to, 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 to adopt to better practices. Um, and I say to young people, we have the numbers and we can hit them where it pays the most. If we boycotted the products just for a day, they would listen to us. 
and they will do better. So again, I speak to young people as a young person that let us remember how powerful we are. And until, and soon and very soon, um, how we, your products are will influence the buying uh, practices of people. And I can't wait for that day because only then shall we have real change in businesses ac across the globe. So I would say the radical way is the only way out. Okay, thank you very much for that. Mirna, this question from Nazar in Bradford. What three things can we do as individuals to effectively contribute to tackling climate, uh, the climate crisis? And what is the biggest thing we could do within our organizations, for example, work, clubs, that sort of thing? What would you say to that, Mirna? Te teach, spread the, spread the good word. I think education is important. And we have so many values from our ancestors in all of our cultures. I think we should be able to create those spaces of exchange, intergenerational ex exchanges where we can share those practices, education, and of course, changing our attitude. It begins from, from what I do every day, from morning until night. What do I do with food? What do I do with waste? What do I do with energy? What do I do with water? Those three things. Radhika, anything that you would like to add on to that one? I haven't asked you yet about any of these questions. Yeah, sure. So in terms of, um, you know, what we can do in our lifestyles, the, the emissions numbers make quite clear that the three, uh, the three areas of everyday life that, that really uh, add up to emissions are the residential. So what are, you know, how our homes are uh, built and how we use energy within homes. Um, uh, mobility, how we move from one space to another, and third is food. What is the kind of food and the emissions from food that we that we have? So I would say focusing on those three things is is the best we can do in terms of um, really moving on lifestyle related emissions. Brilliant, thank you very much for that. Um, and uh, let, let's go. Actually, when you're talking about the first of those things as well, which is in our homes, that actually leads on very well to to Hector's question. Hector asks, how can I reduce energy use in my home? Um, yeah, thanks for that question, Hector. Um, I should actually add to that as well. Uh, how important is it that housing is adapted globally to be less reliant on heating uh, by fossil fuel sources as well? I think that's something important to, to add on to this as well. Um, Jim, what would you say about this? Uh, well, well, I mean, I mean, just to say, it's very hard to generalise these things because different parts yeah. of the world face very, very different problems. Get that? But here, here in the UK, the criteria is get homes insulated. Uh, that that's an important factor to get the energy use requirements down. And the other one will be the move towards electrification, so that we can use low carbon electricity to heat the homes rather than use, using fossil fuels. And that would be the be the way to do it. Just as a general point on behaviour, people can't do it all by themselves. Uh, people's choices are framed by the infrastructures they're operating under, the technologies that are available. And you need to work on all of these three fronts at once. You, you're just relying on people to change their behaviour like that. It won't happen because there are often many barriers imposed. OK, thank you very much for that. So. Um... It's been lovely having you all on. Thank you so much. We're nearing now the end of our discussion. Thank you for the people who've got in touch with their audience questions and uh, for all of you to, to actually listen as well. So huge thanks to everyone for getting involved and also to our panel tonight as well. Um, just to bring the uh, discussion to a close though, it would be great to get a final thought from every single one of you. Um, so if you don't mind, in, in, in one minute or so, I'd like to ask you all this question and then maybe get your thoughts on it. Um, the aim of the Paris Agreement at COP21 in 2015 was to keep global temperature rise to a maximum of 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels, or at worst, two degrees. Um, following COP26 in Glasgow, is 1.5 still alive? What do you think? Wanjui, why don't you go first? Uh, yes, I would say yes, because um, but we need to remember that this is not a responsibility of the global north or the global south or government. This is a responsibility for all of us because we are all affected. Um, but then we have to be very, very intentional on in creating awareness, awareness of the Paris Agreement, awareness of the cli uh, climate crisis that's facing us. Only 
eventually really move forward because I feel many people do not appreciate A, the Paris Agreement and B, um, the climate crisis. And I think once we realize that this is for all of us, I think we'll make great progress. Thank you so much for your words there. Um, Jim, I'd like to come on to you now, just for some final thoughts, your closing uh, statements, I suppose, and also just to answer that question for me, do you think 1.5 is still alive? Is it is it alive? I think it's on life support. If I can, if I can put it in a in a slightly uh, different way, I mean, you, you know, we we have constantly asked this question: Is it still possible to limit warming to one point five? And uh, the the thing, this, the statement I made that Greta Thunberg kindly quoted me on was that it's possible within the laws of physics and chemistry, but it's up to the choices that we all make. That you know, it is still there as a possibility. But really, that was the message of our report that came out in August. Unless really rapid, urgent action is taken, the option will disappear, that for certain. Okay, Jim, thank you. It's been a pleasure talking to you, actually. Um, Radhika, I'd like to bring you up now, your final statements. Uh, what would you like to add to what's been said so far? So the NDCs don't keep 1.5 degrees alive at the moment. Um, the, the numbers that I've seen show that if we go with what we have, we end up in a world that where the medium increase would be 2.4 degrees, going up to 3 degrees. So we're very far from 1.5. However, we have another year um, where, you know, where we can submit enhanced ambition, but it's really implementation that is going to make the difference. Cool. Thank you very much on that and your, your thoughts there. Everyone's been so, so precise and brief, which is which is good to know, because I said in one minute or less, I was expecting people to go on for three to four minutes. But no, it's a very pointed question and you're all giving very pointed answers, which is which is absolutely exactly what we want there. And um, Mirna Cunningham Kane, I mean, let's let's come to you on this one then. What would you say your final statements on this is 1.5 still alive? What would you say? We should keep it alive. We should not try to, 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 to increase it. We should keep it alive, but that demands political will and it demands personal responsibility. We, we all have to try to survive. This is our only planet. And if we do not survive, we will all die. So I think that's our responsibility. So I would like to add by sharing that responsibility with the world. We need to keep it alive. And that depends on what we do at home and the pressure that we bring to our governments and at the global community. Thank you so much. And yeah, Alison, last but certainly not least, I would like to come to you on this one as well now. Just your, your closing remarks on this and uh, you know, following COP26 in Glasgow, what would you say is, is the target is 1.5 still alive? Yes, um, well, I mean, I would, I think, echo a lot of the other panelists and say we, we have kept 1.5 alive, but but as the COP president has said, and to quote him, the pulse is weak, uh, kind of drawing further on, on Jim's analogy. I, I think we we've, we've now need countries to, to step forward next year and then to deliver on the promises made in Glasgow to increase ambition over the next critical decade and, and also to ensure that the finance is flowing to support that and that this is part of a broader effort with the private sector, civil society, youth. I think everybody needs to be involved now over the next couple of critical years as we really um, follow through and try and keep it alive in the next decade. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you to everyone, to all of our panel tonight for, uh, for giving us a varied range of views on the COP26 climate conference. And uh, I've really enjoyed listening, participating, sharing this, and I hope you've all enjoyed listening to it as well. Now we look ahead to COP27 in Egypt next year. I'm sure our audience will feel much better informed as to the workings of COP and what needs to happen next year to, for the good of the planet as well. Uh, thanks also to the speakers that have participated in the series of the Science Museum Group Climate Talks across this year. Don't forget, you can watch all of them online where they're freely available. Follow the link in the description below to do so. Uh, finally, uh, if you'd like to support the Science Museum Group across all five science museums in the UK, which are free to visit and their mission to inspire the next generation of scientists, technicians, doctors, engineers, mathematicians, and climatologists, you can also find a link to make a donation in the description below as well. So thank you all for watching. Thank you all for being a part of this. And 
thank you again to our speakers who I'll finally now say goodbye to. Alison Campbell, it's been great having you with us. Professor Jim Skier, Mirna Cunningham Kane, uh, Dr. Radhika Kosla, and Wanjuhi Njuroge as well. I've been Katra Alam. Thank you all for being with us. Good night.